We're not going to talk about all of Raw right now, but here in this time travel session, let's talk about something you and I talked about off air. You had not seen it. I had. I told you my thoughts without spoiling too much. Everyone's talking about it. Over a million people so far on YouTube are talking about it. CM Punk and Cody Rhodes on Monday Night Raw. Well, yes, and and we had talked Tuesday morning because that's when we uh, gathered together on the phone to discuss all of the breaking news. And I said, I'm going to watch it, but I haven't yet. And you said, well, you won't commit yourself. But holy shit, this was at a completely different level and tone. And as, as we said, a new day with new people in charge and new or maybe old things being allowed now that were verboten before, but just felt like a fucking wrestling show for the time they were talking to each other. It where you could, you could close your eyes and you could envision this happening in mid South wrestling or this happening on in Crockett promotions or in the far distant past, good old days of WCW before Turner broadcasting dismantled it. Big names talking to each other in the middle of the ring. They didn't go this long back in those days, but it was serious. It was, it was adult. It was, it had both guys sounded like they meant what they said. And they told, and this is Jerry Jarrett's old maxim. They told enough of the truth that people knew to be the truth. So that when they started working, it wasn't an abrupt change. It was a natural progression, and you couldn't tell where one left off and the other began. It was... Uh, there was... Uh, you, we know that Cody is a huge baby face, and Punk is popular and controversial. He hasn't established he's going to be a baby face in the ring. He hasn't said anything or give, given any of the you know, normal activity of a heel. He's not coming out being an asshole verbally. He's not knocking people. He's not lying. He's talking to people and telling the truth and being a normal human being. But he said that he didn't come there to make friends. He came to make money. And so even though you've got nominally two baby faces, there's still, it's great that there is the wonder of what's going to happen and who's going to do what. And whether or not, you know, if one of them or the other wins the Royal Rumble, that they will still remain friends, wink, wink. You know, something might happen. But this was just, it was big time. And it was too, and the people were not only popping and chanting for both guys, but they were listening to what they were saying to the point that the fucking zingers didn't get cheers or boos they got ooze like at a goddamn studio audience rather than an arena with 15,000 people in it they were hanging on the words they were listening to what they were saying and I, coming out of this you not only want to know what's going to happen between these two in the Royal Rumble you want to see them wrestle in some fashion you want to know the next thing that's going to happen or take place or whether you've guessed it right or not, this was fucking brilliant. Talk for me for a second. Well, I thought the zingers, if we're going to call them that, were creative. It was creatively done. The way they hit each other, you're waiting for it. And when Punk hit him first, like you said, the crowd, ooh. And then Cody hit him back perfectly. And, you know, I hate to, I mean, I want you to talk more about what you think about the segment, but let's bring it up here. I hate to always have to go back to this, but enough people are talking about it. <laughs> you look at the dichotomy now between AEW and WWE. What you just saw on Raw should have been the biggest moment in Dynamite history. It should have been something leading to the biggest event or moment in AEW history. It's something that should have been on a path of growing viewership or interest. I believe the Raw ratings, this segment peaked at 1.9 million viewers live. Good Lord. It jumped. It was it like jumped like three hundred thousand viewers, and then you see like the young bucks come back and no one cares. It's crazy not to look at Cody and Punk here in this situation, 
and realize this could have been somewhere else. And now look at where we are today. Well, yeah, it, it's Tony's most high profile alumni that used to work there. And Cody was not, not popular with that audience because he was the anomaly um, amongst the original group that they brought there that wasn't the trampoline play playground parkour expert that was the business mind that wanted to be Dusty Rhodes' son, that wanted to take interest in the production and the creative and the promoting and be an executive, and the other ones wanted to jack around with the, you know, Tony's fucking pocketbook. And so off he goes, and he becomes the hottest baby face in the biggest company in the world. And then Punk, who goes in there to AEW, with the attitude of, I want to prove that I can make a difference and I'm going to draw him some money and we're going to take this thing somewhere. And he did, but they didn't. And especially the, the buckaroos were so insistent on keeping that campaign up to fucking drive him nuts and run him off that finally, all right, fuck it. And he immediately goes to the fucking same company and becomes the biggest fucking attraction they've got. Because which he, one are you talking? Every, which one of these two punk, guys are you talking about? Okay, punk. And, and now if, every time he he came out and broke social media, his quarter, his first quarter on television jumped four hundred thousand fucking viewer jumped, not did, like he was doing on Saturday night for the other guys but jumped 400,000. So Tony had all the ingredients for the cure for cancer and he fucking threw them out because he had a couple of fucking stale expired NyQuil pills. And now they're doing all the numbers that, you know, that we've talked about, but it's part of this five. He should be five bill fill, by the way, instead of one bill fill. But we're talking about these guys doing this number, these numbers over here. And meanwhile, Tony is left with a hospital ward full of top talent and a hangdog look on his face. Like, what the fuck? I booked a tournament. Well, we'll get back to your thoughts about this promo. Let me just bring this up just to compare in terms of decision making and how hot things are and how cold things are. CM Punk and Cody Rhodes, War of Words, the full segment, not to count any clip segments they've already put up. In one day on WWE's YouTube, has done 1.3 million views. And that would probably be an addition to the people, almost 2 million that saw it live. Why would they go back and watch it? Maybe some of them watched it again, but there, there's unique viewers, as they say. Six days ago, AEW put up the video for the Young Bucks interview with Renee on Dynamite. Oh, their big return where they were going to explain themselves and what was going on. Spy versus spy. That went up six days ago. It's done 100,000 views. <laughs> for the record, the Jim Cornette review of that segment went up three days ago, and that has 91,000 views. Ah. So we're going to pass that. So we got three days to catch it. More people listen to us talk about what they said than listen to them say it the fuck and that's the road aew went down and again they didn't just run off punk punk's not the only one we're talking about here cody rhodes a lot more diplomatic than cm punk but he's in wwe for a lot of reasons and again they never mention aew not that they would have but in aew if this had happened it would have been all about wwe all well, about yeah. something you did somewhere else all about alluding to things from someplace else they didn't do that here, and they could have. That would have been the because, lazy way out. Well, because they reveal themselves in in every promotional war, the outlaws, the opposition would talk about the number one company. The number one company wouldn't talk about the outlaws. But now, back then, the outlaws, they were bitter, and they were mad at these people, the promoters and the bookers and the top stars individually, and they wanted to talk bad about them on television to vent their spleen and get it out of their system. Well, now it's not that they're mad. They're marks. And when when Tony and any of his guys talk about on their television 
well, when you main evented WrestleMania or when you did this or that or the other thing in the WWE, it's because to them, that's a bigger deal than where they are now. They're revealing that they subconsciously, because they're Marks and they're fans and the worst kind of fans, Marks, that puts them over to everybody as a bigger deal if they've been to the WWE or if they can talk about when they were together in the WWE. We used to be friends. Why aren't we friends? I want to be friends. We were all friends in the WWE. Well, you know, the first, ooh, you brought up before the reactions of the crowd. I think the first one may have been when Punk said, I want to talk about your dad. Yeah. That got the first reaction. Well, well, hold on. We've run off and left some of the people who didn't go to YouTube or see it. Um, this was the, it was the 10 o'clock hour on Raw, but they started at, at 9.53 Eastern, seven minutes till. Cody did his entrance first, and people sing his shit, and whoa! And he got the big pops, and when he got in the ring before he could speak and really say anything, suddenly the music transitioned, and it was like Mussolini! Ugh. In New Orleans. That works. See, there you go. Keep going. Baked oysters, if you please. <laughs> now it's but lazy. Anyway, now, now you're lazy. They got another big pop. And there was more big reactions. And Punk got in and they, Punk and Cody shook hands. And when they brought the music down, Punk got chance. But then some people were like, well, and they started chanting for Cody. And their whole interview, they started, they even had the proper expressions on their faces and the proper tension in their body language where they started out casually speaking with a little, a little edge to it, but as friends and nicely and, and it escalated like it would if they were really doing it. And you know, uh, but the story of it was basically Punk said, hey, we're friends, and on Sunday morning, I hope we're still going to be friends. And Punk wanted to talk about your dad, and ooh. And Punk said that Dusty called him in 2007 when Cody went to Ohio Valley Wrestling. So I'm sending my son to OVW, keep an eye on him. And it, Punk told Cody how proud he was of him because he didn't fall into the the traps and vices of many of our contemporaries, and he didn't have to keep an eye on Cody. But on Saturday, it feels like I'm breaking my promise because I won't be looking out for you. I'm going to do what I got to do. And then Cody said, hey, everybody sees Dusty when they, they see me, but I've done everything to be my own man. And when I showed up to OVW, by the way, OVW, did not get this much goddamn conversation and attention on national TV when we were actually working with them. And now that now that it was the best years of everybody's life. But it, it, Cody admitted he showed up to OVW, a nepotism hire, and Punk had been in the business in the Indies for 10 years. But we got to be friends. And Saturday's bittersweet because there are no friends. But Punk said, well, what about Sunday? I can separate business from personal. Because the business to you is personal. You grew up in it. So how are you going to separate this? And Punk uncorked a fucking brief little promo on how he saw Cody, not Dusty, the first time he met Cody because he didn't have that background. But Two different paths have one similar goal. I mean, this was great shit. And then finally, Punk said, my father was an electrician. He was blue collar. I'm more the American dream than you are. Boom. There it was. Oh, what a line. And then Cody stiffened up a bit. Well, let's talk about the pipe bomb. And so Punk tosses the mic flag off the microphone. And Cody told Punk, well, you inspired people with that to, to, to get them to, to make changes. And then you left and you didn't do any of that shit. But I walked the walk where you didn't. So that makes me more CM Punk than you. Ooh. Oh, <laughs> another, another one. What a line. Oh. Yes. And it, I, it, 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 this is also, I don't, I wasn't in the room. But I would be flabbergasted 
if the writers had more than the first draft and a vague outline on this, this is all Punk and all Cody. And so Punk sold that. He took his jacket off and got up in Cody's face, and it was the fucking The Rock and Hogan or Hogan and Andre or whatever comparison you want. And Punk uncorked it. I can't even begin to describe it again. He was on a roll. And then Cody responds. And I run, this is great. And then Cody quoted Dusty, quoting John Wayne, and then vowed to go through Punk in the Rumble and started to walk past him. And Punk grabbed Cody's arm and jerked him around, and they went nose to nose again and forehead to forehead. And the crowd was hot, and they had dueling chants going. And then each guy kept their eyes on each other, and they stepped out on opposite sides of the ring. 17 minutes of gold, Jerry Gold. That, uh, I mean, Punk's all, I've been involved in several of them, but that was one of the better promo segments of, of modern fucking wrestling since we've been doing this, isn't it? Punk's been a part of several segments in AEW and WWE that we've said is the modern equivalent of Mid-South Wrestling. It's not exactly the same, but things would be different on TV now than it was in 1984 or 85. But the modern equivalent of what that would be, that feeling you would get watching it. The tone, the intensity, the inflection, the, That's right. the, the, the seriousness of the thing, uh, the serious as far as the guys involved are taking it seriously. Now, do you think they should have, before I say my next comment, I'll ask you the question, do you think they should have had anyone out there to break them up? Should it have been something where they walk off on their own? Or should it have been something where... If they're going to go face to face, they should be pulled away. You know, it, it, no, they didn't need. And, and because then, then we go into the, the lack of logic when there's going to be a fucking sledgehammer attack in the next segment, nobody comes out. If these two guys are fucking talking mean to each other and about to fight shit, we better get out there. That's where they need an announcer and, or an authority figure of the promotion not the general man. Nick Aldis doesn't have to be out there, Adam Pierce, for every goddamn deal, but someone that's official, that's a neutral party, and that's usually the announcer role in wrestling that would be there to step and say, not gentlemen, or just to react even facially, not to butt in, but to, I mean, even, you know, even the greatest band in the world needs a tambourine player. There's, you know, a little more cowbell, man. It adds something. Some, visual semblance of realism and not only on the the presentation of the program but when there was the jim ross or the lance russell or the gordon soley or the insert your favorite wrestling announcer standing there it, there was just some visual representation that this guy is trying to explain to you no you can't fight no gentlemen gentlemen it didn't have to be a big pull apart but that's what wrestling is missing is and not only the announcer to do the the fills like the backup guitar player might in the middle like well i can't believe you said that and the other guy transitioned to and or just react or reiterate or sometimes clarify in a, a few words or one sentence and give it back to the guy when he's flummoxed like you know i think about the lawler uh jim valiant confrontation on memphis tv and how as this is happening, as Jimmy Valiant's quickly going from being someone they tolerated to being an enemy of Lawler, there's people all around. Lance Russell's there. Dave, I think, maybe still sitting down. <laughs> but Lance Russell's standing there. Wayne Ferris is out there. Various guys are out there. Right. I think Eddie Marlin may have been out there. This interaction's happening. It's not supposed to happen. It feels like something could happen, so we're all out here. Again, I'm not saying this needed that, but... Well, I, I see what you're saying, but see, again, then that that was a different kind of thing because, number one, in the studio, as they started arguing, friends of theirs, who were friends of each person, because they were both baby faces, Bill Dundee and Wayne Ferris is, was Lawler's cousin, but was teaming with Jimmy Valiant. They started wandering out because mutual friends of theirs were in an argument, and it was it was getting more hostile. 
And also, they only had to walk 50 feet. <laughs> the, in this giant NBA arena, the WWE's also fucking established that everybody gets music if they're going to come out. This was too long and too involved, and other people would have stepped on it because you would have had to have brought... To have mutual friends of theirs come out, you'd had to brought some pretty big stars out. It would have been a distraction. I see where you're going with it, and it, and that did look more realistic in Memphis than this. But here's another thing. It seems like they ought to be able to do something like that further down this road because they got in starting out as friends, even though it got out of hand. The Memphis angle ended up in a fight. This didn't get physical. But who's to say that at some point after the Royal Rumble, that when they decide whether they're friends on Sunday morning, that maybe they would get more heated in a face-to-face -face argument and people would might start trickling out, agents, people in suits. Come on, guys, whatever the fuck. Because these guys are so real at it, they do need the background to create the atmosphere. But I almost think this one was better that nobody got in the fucking way. But I still would love to see a good experienced announcer that can verbally referee and do the fills just to make it look good without taking over the fucking yeah. program. Without sticking their face in like Aubrey Edwards in that famous clip and yes, between the two yes. people facing off. You know, it builds upon several weeks of great segments that were talking segments on Raw. Drew McIntyre and Cody, Drew McIntyre and Punk. A lot of them centered around Drew McIntyre. But a lot of what SmackDown had, it feels like. Raw's now getting, in terms of these great segments with personality. You don't even mind that there isn't a match. It's most of the matches are women's tag matches anyway, <laughs> seems like. But this was an incredible segment, and it leaves you intrigued what's going to happen next. This may be the most intrigued I am for a Royal Rumble in a very long time. Well, and I think I said it earlier, I'm not sure in which segment of the program, but I, you know, I can see the way that they set up Gunther and Seth, and I can see... Gunther being able to take care of a guy with a bad leg and look like he's killing him, but at the same time, it will go short by the nature of it, and, and Gunther could win the Royal Rumble, challenge Seth at WrestleMania, and win that title to be able to defend it and give Seth a dragon to slay, a comeback road, a redemption story that he would maybe, you know, when he got more serious with Punk is when we started liking Seth. We just don't like the... in the Cesar Romero specials, but... Uh, at the same time, Cody and Punk is a natural to bubble under Roman and whatever because Cody and Punk have such similar stories they need to finish. Cody and Punk could be a great match, but it could be an epic feud if done yeah. right. They're in each other's way. And, and I think they're at a position now where you could really let the people pick their side and... Each guy could be true to themselves and still not try to castrate anybody with a rusty fishing knife. Just try to get, you know, what they want, you know, past the other guy. 